You think we should kick it off? I think go for it, yeah. Cool. So Tom, do you want to take it away? <laughs> I certainly <laughs> can, yes. Uh, so maybe just again, yeah, to kick it off a little bit. Uh, my, my name is Tom Bradley, and I am serving as your department head and Woodward professor for the Department of Systems Engineering at Colorado State University. And uh, I'm very glad, very excited to be able to, um, you know, sort of provide some hosting of this uh, info session. This information session is really particularly oriented towards students who might be interested in our master's degree programs that are offered at Colorado State University in the Department of Systems Engineering, but are offered at a distance. Um, so maybe let's just go to the next slide and I'll talk about what some of the agenda that we'll go through is. I'll give you a quick intro to some of the folks who are gonna do the talking here. Um, I'll describe a little bit about what systems engineering is in general and then what our department of systems engineering at Colorado State is about. Uh, I'll ask Ingrid Bridge, our uh, graduate program coordinator, uh, to be able to describe the differences between some of the different master's programs that we do have available at Colorado State University. Uh, we'll invite some discussion about CSU Online uh, from Lauren Kelly, who's our online student success coach, and uh, go over a couple application tips and uh, some resources that are available for students and such. And then uh, would absolutely invite questions or if there are things that come up or if you want to chat them or anything else like that over the course of this information session, do please do so. And um, uh, we'll, we'll make sure we get all the questions answered before we close out the session today. So for a uh, quick introduction, again, I got to introduce myself. I hope you all forgive me. Uh, I, was, uh, I, I am actually uh, in south of Phoenix in Arizona. You, you may or may not know, but there's a couple of uh, automotive electric vehicle factories that are starting up in this area of the United States. And so I'm working with them to be able to do some industrial engineering and systems engineering around their activities here. So um, sort of get to get out in the field a little bit and see what's going on. That's very exciting for me. Um, but also, again, I sort of serve as the administrative department head, um, and, as well as a professor in the Department of Systems Engineering. Next, uh, Ingrid, would you just do a quick introduction so folks can see your face and hear your voice? Sure, yes. Um, I'm Ingrid Bridge, and I'm the, the primary student advisor, and I'm the graduate program coordinator for the department, so I can help with almost any logistical paperworky type questions um, and like the application, those types of things. I'm, I'm your person. Fantastic. Thank you, Ingrid. And then Lauren Kelly, would you just do a quick introduction so students can uh, put a name to the face there? Go ahead. You got it. You got it. Thank you, everyone, for for coming. Uh, like he said, my name is Lauren Kelly, and I am the graduate student success coach for systems engineering. So it's likely that um, I've spoken with some of you before. Some of you I might even have on my calendar to talk with after after next week after Thanksgiving. So um, I am usually the first person that you'll chat with if you are interested in the CSU online program. So Ingrid and I really work hand in hand, um, helping students kind of get through the application process with online. Happy to be here. Thank you so much, Lauren. Okay, well, just to kick us off then, you know, one of the most common questions we sort of get is what is systems engineering? What is systems engineering about? Uh, many of our students, of course, are familiar with the disciplines of engineering, whether that's electrical engineering or mechanical engineering or civil engineering. And um, systems engineering is also a discipline of engineering. It's a set of tools that we use to be able to design and, and implement and, and maintain and execute uh, systems. Now, the difference, one of the big differences between the domain of systems engineering and the domain that are other domains of the College of Engineering at Colorado State University and other places too, is that systems engineers are really tasked with thinking broadly about these problems. We sort of systems engineers, uh, the, the, the task is to be able to uh, engage in systems thinking, to be able to cross these uh, you know, boundaries that exist between other 
uh, components of our system to be able to be responsible for the overall functioning, for the broadest possible functioning of our system. So when we think about systems engineering and the skill set that we try to embed in students in systems engineering, it's not just focused on uh, you know, a particular set of, uh, of domain tools, not just focused on electromagnetism or mechanical uh, thermodynamics or something like that. We're trying to build up engineers who can really cross those boundaries and be able to use their skill sets. And these skill sets are skill sets that are in their disciplines, but also in management and also in uh, requirements engineering and also in optimization, also in cybersecurity, all these kind of topic sets that are many of the, 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 the core of many of our modern problems in systems engineering. We try to train students who can use those to be able to solve the big problems that are out there in the world today. Those problems are things that you'll, you know, that we all want to be working on. They're problems like, uh, you know, in aerospace and defense. It's problems in cybersecurity and in sustainability. These are the tasks of the systems engineer, and this, our systems engineering department is designed to be able to train students who will be able to be um, executors of that activity. So, next slide, if you don't mind, Catherine. Um, when, when we think about our department of, at Colorado State University, and maybe just go on to the next slide so we have our talking points there, um, the, uh, the, the systems engineering department at, at Colorado State University is both a, um, you know, we, we have a, our sort of education mission, and we also have a, a research mission. So we do a lot of work that is engaged with our local industry. We do um, research that is funded by the National uh, Science Foundation or Department of Energy or NASA or all these kind of folks. And uh, but the, the objective is, we, as is characteristic for all of the departments at Colorado State University, we take those learnings and our goal is to be able to trans, transmit that to the students through a coursework and through a research activity that's associated with, in particular, our master's degrees. That really leads to, a, I think, a unique relationship in our department between the university and industry. So especially in the College of Engineering, we're sort of the most uh, industry-facing part of the College of Engineering. And I think that really makes us one of the most industry-facing parts of the entire university. It means that we are trying to be responsive to what we understand is the charge from, um, from you know, enterprises, whether that's, that's uh, industrial enterprises or whether that's government or whether that's, um, you know, e even the nonprofit worlds or all these kinds of things. We try to be responsive to the, to the need. So when we, so you will, for example, when you come through our program, you'll have exposure to the ideas that are very important in systems engineering, the sort of foundational ideas, but you'll also have exposure to some of the new topics that are of particular interest. And again, whether that's model-based systems engineering or cybersecurity activities or machine learning or artificial intelligence, all these kind of things, um, those are topics that we understand, we hear from our industry partners are important and that they need people, they need a workforce that can be um, engaged with those topics. And so we can actually do the work of training people um, in those, you know, to be responsive to that need. And so, you know, the big idea is then, then out of the other side of our program, we have a very strong relationship with a uh, local industry in Colorado. We have a very strong relationship with a national uh, systems engineering um, sort of workforce development pipeline that, that ends up at places that where we've had folks who go off into the aerospace industry, folks who go off into um, government, folks who go off into consulting, even civil engineering and these kinds of things. So a broad uh, sort of set of targets for students who might be interested in, um, you know, in, in, in graduating with a master's degree in our system. So now with that, I sort of uh, maybe go on to the, the, the next slide, Ingrid, and, and then I'll pass it over to Ingrid, uh, or I'll pass it over to Ingrid for more details here. But a couple of key points is that our systems engineering department is a graduate only program. So, um, you know, we only offer master's and doctoral degrees and a certificate that's a grad only, um, a grad level. Um, all of our courses, a, a unique characteristic of our program is that all of our courses are offered online and in person. So if you happen to be local or local to Colorado or something, then uh, you're welcome to come into classroom or come up for uh, presentations or to meet the faculty or do any of those sorts of things that are the conventional parts of engaging at the university. But also 
we, uh, we designed the program to be flexible around uh, students who might be engaged professionally at the same time that they're going to school. So students can, uh, all of our courses are offered 5 to 8 p.m. on weekdays, so sort of mostly after the working day is done. And, uh, but they're also recorded. And so if you need to engage or you have travel that comes up or all these kind of things like that, that's very normal. It's very expected for our population of students. And so we have enough, enough flexibility kind of designing the program to allow you to continue to um, engage in your workplace, engage in family life and all these kinds of things while you're going to school. Our faculty uh, has been, we've been growing our program over the last few years, and uh, we've now uh, been able to really broaden the types and, and uh, research interests and, and educational interests of our faculty to the point where we have faculty that are, that, that are you know, responsive to almost every application, to many of the key tools uh, in systems engineering. So I have no doubt, again, that you'll find faculty members who have sort of traded the line between industry and academia, who've served in government. We have faculty members who are veterans and, and understand the DOD environment, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, I, you know, we sort of have a broad range of folks for students to become engaged with and to, uh, to work with as you go through your master's program at CSU. Um, and then, you know, the last kind of point here is really that, uh, you know, we, we sort of say that we have online and on-campus this is a boundary that really does not exist in our department. Uh, we have students who will move back and forth if it, from, from one course to another. We have students who will move back and, you know, you're, you're, you can come up and, and if you have a, a Thursday afternoon off and want to come up to Fort Collins and, and study at the library and go to class at five o'clock, you are absolutely welcome to do that too. So the point is the, the degree that you will receive in the Master of Engineering and Master of Science degree at Colorado State University is the same degree that folks who are on campus will receive, um, whether you're online or on campus or halfway in between. So these are some of the things that I think really make our, our program unique and some of the things we're really proud of. And at this point, I'll hand it over to Ingrid Bridge and ask her to do a little bit of explanation about what some of the details of these programs are. So take it away, Ingrid. Thank you. Uh, so, so yes, yeah, so we do have two master's degree options. Um, and one of the most common questions I will get is what is the difference between your two master's programs? And if you just were to look at our curriculum, you might see a lot of similarities, but certainly there are some functional differences. Um, so for the master of engineering, I would say this is a more common degree in industry. It's often for folks who maybe have done a, a few years in industry after their bachelor's degree, they come get a, a master's degree with us. Um, and then they want to go right back into industry and apply what they've learned. Um, and so th that's kind of the most common student you'll see in the Master of Engineering. Uh, the other nice thing is the Master of Engineering can be a coursework only degree. So that means you would take 10 courses and you would qualify to graduate. Um, you do not have to do any type of extra project or defense or anything like that. Um, so again, that, that might make it a little bit more straightforward if you are an industry, you know, an employee in industry currently. Um, the Master of Engineering also has coursework that's intended to be a little more structured and provide a little more of a strong foundation, a common foundation across all Master of Engineering students. So we do have a core, um, a required core, which gives you just a good solid, you know, what is systems engineering and what are some of the basic tools for it. And then you can pick some systems engineering depth courses to customize your degree. And then we have some electives too. So you could even take uh, courses in College of Business or in other engineering departments, those types of things. Um, so, but the, the primary point of the Master of Engineering is to give you kind of a breadth of information. So you are moving forward, able to solve a variety of, of complex problems. The Master of Science um, is slightly, is gonna be more common in academia. And certainly if you were maybe interested in going on for a PhD at some point, I would recommend the Master of Science for you. Uh, we do see it in industry though. So we might consider this a slightly more versatile degree. It does require either a project or a thesis. I'll get into a little bit more depth into that in a moment, but know that it does require some type of one-on-one -on -one work with a faculty member on some project. Um, and the coursework for the Master of Science is a little more flexible. We don't have any hard required classes. About half the degree, you would be choosing systems depth courses from a variety of options. We have quite a few course options. 
Um, and the other half would be electives and you know whatever your project or thesis credits are. So it's really intended for you to be able to customize to your specific industry or your specific thesis idea, those types of things. Uh, the time to graduation for both of these, they're both 30 credit degrees and the time to graduation is about the same. And it will depend of course on how many classes you take per semester. So for a full-time student taking three classes or nine credits a semester, you can usually finish the degree in about a year and a half to two years. And we do have summer course options if you wanted to try to speed that up. Um, that's usually where we get about a year and a half if you're taking summer courses as well. For part-time students who might take one or two classes a semester, uh, it might take three to five years. And this is the most common, uh, for, especially for online students. Most of our students are taking one or two classes per semester. Um, the next slide here will show you, this is a kind of a small detail, but some students really like to know this. Um, these are screenshots from transcripts of people who have earned our degrees. And so the Master of Engineering, you'll see um, your major is technically engineering and you have a specialization in systems engineering. Whereas the Master of Science, your major will be systems engineering. The other thing you'll note uh, is that it does not stay online anywhere on these programs. So as Dr. Bradley noted, um, your transcript, your diploma, nothing will distinguish you as an online student, you're taking the exact same courses that our on-campus students are, you have access to the same resources. Um, so there's really not any distinction there. And then, so getting into the MS uh, options, I mentioned there's a thesis or a project. And if you are applying for the MS, you will see plan A or plan B on the application. So this is gonna explain what that means. So the, the thesis track or the plan A requires a nine credit research project. And that's, so that's a the full thesis. This is usually a multi-semester research effort with a faculty member um, and 60 to 100 pages. That's just kind of an estimate to give, it, give you an idea of scope. So really this can vary considerably depending on what type of research you're doing. Um, the plan A would require a faculty advisor to be secured prior to admission into the plan A track. Uh, because the research project is intensive, you, you really do need to, to establish that connection and relationship with a faculty advisor. Make sure that you kind of have a plan for what your thesis will be before you enter the program. Um, this, the thesis is a great opportunity for you to learn more if you're interested in the academic research process, if you want to you know, make some contribution to the academic literature, if you might be interested in a PhD and you want to see what what, is, what it's like to be uh, doing a research project in academia. Those are great options to pursue the thesis. Um, and this does also require a thesis defense at the end of the degree. Uh, the plan B project then alternatively is a three credit um, project. So it's usually just about a one semester effort. Uh, you can focus this kind of on the academic side or the applied side. A lot of our online students do a project that is you know, has some tie with their workplace. Um, and so it can be very applied to what you're doing. And um, again, the scope is much smaller because it's just the one semester that you usually would be working on this. Uh, we, you end up having a couple more classes that you can take since you're just doing three credits a project. Um, and so then the project kind of becomes a capstone at the end of your degree. You've taken a lot of classes, you've learned a lot of things, and then you're working one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member at the end to create something or solve some problem or approach some problem in a novel way. Um, and that's kind of the capstone experience. And then um, lastly, this is really, I mean, the project is a way that you can establish or um, demonstrate to maybe future employers and things that you can take what you've learned in school and you can apply that um, in really interesting ways. So those are, those are just a quick overview of our master's options. All right, so um, I will talk a little bit about CSU online and kind of what to expect while, while completing a master's online. Um, the first thing that I want to reiterate is uh, CSU online serves as an extension of the main campus in Fort Collins. So it's same faculty, same academic standards and rigor, same education. Um, and I'm so glad that, that both um, Ingrid and Dr. Bradley uh, made that clear. I get asked all the time, will it say online on my transcript? No. Um, or on my diploma? No. So 
uh, definitely, definitely a great way to take classes if you are needing that flexibility. A lot of our students in this program are also working full time and managing a family and life and all of that and doing the degree. And so as far as things to expect, um, like like both of them had said already, uh, video recorded lectures. A lot of our students, um, yes, that five to eight is is after work, but oftentimes, you know, if we if you're a student that might be Eastern time zone or Pacific time zone, you may have to catch the recording for those courses. Um, that being said, I think our faculty are all awesome, and you can still really anticipate a lot of engagement from instructors. Um, they are very responsive to students and each of them do have office hours as well to connect with faculty. So I know that sometimes students can be concerned about still having access to faculty and access to resources, even as an online student. And um, with our program, uh, like, like I said earlier, the faculty is the same as uh, for the online as the on-campus um, option. So um, and then the last thing that I wanted to touch on briefly is um, time management and self-management. Uh, I think a lot of times within um, master's degrees, a lot of people say, oh, you have to really learn how to manage your time, which is true. But um, I think we, we all often have very similar amounts of time. And when you might want to watch a Ted Lasso episode instead of working on your homework, um, I think it has more to do with self-management and less to do with time management. So since we do have the asynchronous nature for our classes, um, they can be completed on your own time. So as long as you are looking at the deadlines listed on the syllabi, you're able to manage your time and yourself um, in a way that's going to be most beneficial to you. So. I would say overall the benefits of a, an online degree are looking at that flexibility piece, um, expert faculty within this field and other working professionals in your classes as well. Um, I think oftentimes we approach degrees as learning from the faculty, but oftentimes you're learning just as much from the students in your classes and the faculty are probably learning just as much from you as well. So um, yeah, and I think a, a huge a huge benefit to the online learning as well is that students can often maintain their current employment while they're doing the degree online. So it demonstrates this self-motivation to future employers, which is huge. And also in a COVID-19 world, post-COVID-19 world, uh, virtual communication has been becoming, is becoming increasingly important. And so I think doing a degree online can really emphasize that um, those skills, it can really help you learn more of that time management and self-management. So that's a little bit about online learning. Um, and I would love to talk with you further. If you're curious about our online options, feel free to schedule a call with me um, or you can go to my Calendly. Um, just a quick note, I will be out of the office next week for those of you who are live with us, um, but I will be back the first week of December and I'd be happy to chat with you about your upcoming application for fall 2022. All right, um, so hopefully by now you're thinking, well, this sounds great. What would be my next steps um, if I wanted to apply? And uh, I'll just walk through some kind of the, the overview of the application and maybe some, some tips um, to make sure that you have a good uh, competitive and complete application with us. Um, so the first thing is that we have on our website um, application checklists and instructions. And this is a PDF document that walks you through all of the minimum requirements that would be required, you know, pre math prereqs and things that you would need to have before you should apply, um, GPA requirement, those things. And then um, on the second page, it starts a checklist. It's very detailed, step-by-step. -step. How do you apply? What things do you need to submit to us to have a complete application? Um, so I'd recommend you go uh, download that PDF and then just follow it very carefully. Uh, in terms of timeline, our master's programs do have a rolling admissions process. And what that means is when you submit to us a fully complete application, we can usually get you a, an admissions decision within about one to two weeks. So the earlier that you submit your application, the earlier you will know what your plans are for fall of 2022 or whenever you're applying. Um, do note that we have a final um, application deadline, however, and so you want to make sure that you not only have your application submitted by that deadline, but you also have all of your other materials received by the department. So all of your transcripts, your letters of re recommendation, 
must be with us by that listed final deadline. Um, next tip here is to make sure not only that you meet the minimum requirements shown in the application instructions, but also that you know where in your application materials that is reflected. So we only have your materials to review. Um, and if, if you do not show us, for example, that you meet the math prereqs, um, or you're, you know, if you have any questions about maybe how you might meet some of these things, I'd encourage you to reach out to me and I can help you strategize. Some folks, for example, don't take a formal statistics course, but they use statistics in their job every day. Um, and so, you know, you, we can strategize how, how can you submit that information so that when we're reviewing your application, we can see clearly how you meet all of these minimums. Um, there are some common elements to, for all of our master's programs here. Uh, we do require a current resume or CV. And as I would recommend it, with anything that you submit a resume for, I would suggest that you tailor your resume so that we're seeing the specific highlights in your background about you know, what's relevant for this program, what, what shows that you're gonna be able to succeed in this program. We have a statement of purpose required. It's two pages um, and that's your opportunity to tell us anything about why you're applying, why you're excited about CSU uh, or systems engineering as a field, or maybe how you think our department can help you accomplish your professional goals. Um, all of these things would be great to cover in that statement of purpose. We have three letters of recommendation uh, required at a minimum. You could submit more if you'd like. Um, of these three letters, we tend to recommend at least one person as a faculty member from your previous education experience. Uh, if, if you have professional experience, one to be a supervisor or somebody who can really speak to like your professional technical skills. Um, and then the third person can be anybody else, uh, you know, who, who can really speak in detail to uh, your skills and your background that can help you succeed in our graduate program in systems engineering. Uh, the GRE scores, we now have fully optional for all applicants. Um, and you could submit GRE scores if you wanted. For example, if you took the test already for a different program and they were good scores, you could submit them. Or if you have a kind of a weaker area you think in your application you want to try to make up for, those are great reasons to submit the GRE if you'd like. Um, but they're not required and they'll never be used to compare you know, against other applicants. So it's only they're only considered kind of in the holistic picture that we look at as to, you know, if you as an applicant are qualified for our program. If you are an international student, uh, English proficiency scores will be required if the primary official language of your country of origin was not English. Um, if you have a U.S. degree, then you might be eligible for a, a waiver of the, those English proficiency scores. And then there is an application fee. Um, of course, there's an application fee waiver that we can potentially offer for you. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Um, but one last point here, the MS Plan A, that's the thesis track, as I mentioned, will require a faculty advisor to be secured uh, before you could be considered for that program. If you submit a master's, uh, master's of science application, but you don't have an advisor, you will be automatically considered for the Plan B. Um, and if you're admitted to the Plan B, and you find an advisor, you know, maybe in your first semester in the program, you could you could swap to the plan A if you wanted to. So that's a strategy that you could use if you are having trouble locating an advisor. Maybe you're just not sure if you really want to do the thesis yet or not. You could certainly just start with the plan B. All right. Now, this might be the reason that you are here tonight, um, but the application fee waiver info, um, these are the steps you'll take to, to actually request the application fee waiver. First thing to note, this is only for online master's applicants. So unfortunately, this is not a, an option for doctoral applicants um, who, are, who are applying for an online program. So if you are an online master's applicant, your steps would be to fully com complete your application. So when you go into your application, um, the online portal, you fill out your information, you upload your resume and your statement of purpose and all of that, um, you will hit submit. And then it will give you access to a checklist that shows you uh, which transcripts or letters of recommendation are still missing. So that's a great resource where you can actually see when your application is fully complete. When it is complete, um, and the only thing you have left to do is that application fee, then you will email our department. You'll put the SYSE payment code in the, in the subject line, and then please include your full name and the semester you're applying for and request that waiver and then we can get that taken care of uh, for you. So um, 
I believe that those are the application pieces. Um, now we have some discussion on resources and funding options. I think I'll talk to that. Uh, so um, just wanted to, you know, again, for, for online students, we really have designed the program to provide online students with a variety of, of uh, sort of, you know, social and interaction and, um, and, and, you know, even technical sort of connections to the university and to the department. Some examples of some of that are things like we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, student subcommittee that uh, reports to our departmental uh, DEI committee. And this is a really great way to be able to get students sort of involved in uh, university activities on, on a variety of fronts. And, and when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion at the university, of course, we talk about that in the broadest possible sense. So this includes uh, of course, on you know underrepresented groups uh, includes uh, you know veterans. It includes folks with disabilities, folks for, uh, who are uh, later in their career. All these kind of things like that. So uh, sort of to treat that, I think, as a as a sort of broad category in which we can seek out student engagement. Another example is we have recently started up um, a, a local chapter, a university chapter of the International Council on. Um, systems engineering. And uh, this sort of is very exciting because, for example, uh, this gives us, uh, you know, opportunity to uh, interact with, with industry folks, to be able to go to the conferences, um, to be able to invite speakers and do these kind of things. Uh, but also, it really connects well with a couple of programs that we have going on in our department. For example, Every student who uh, takes our SISI 501, our introduction, introductory course to systems engineering, and passes that course with a grade of, uh, you know, a, 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 with B plus and above or whatever it is, will be able to um, skip the examination for the certification for ASEP and CSEP for the International Council on Systems Engineering certifications. Um, so that's the kind of activities that we can sort of coordinate and put together and be able to think about when we um, express and, and build these connections to NCOSI. We have similar relationships with the American Society of Engineering Management. Um, we do some things like we have Friday departmental talks that are uh, student oriented and trying to work on, uh, you know, try to present research activities and education activities and um, tips for success within grad school and all these kind of things. And we also, of course, have, uh, I mean, the, the, the broad point, point here is that you will have access to all of the sort of things that are so great about being involved with the university. Uh, some of that is these kind of social things we talk about, connectivity to the, uh, to the state of the art and to exciting people who are working in the field. And some of it is also just tools. So uh, we have, act, you know, online students have access to software tools. Uh, you are a full student of Colorado State University. So if you want to come to, uh, you know, uh, hang out on campus or use the library or go to football games or all these kind of things like that, those are also options for, for students. Um, the second column here is really about on-campus resources. And, and uh, again, many, many opportunities for graduate students to get involved on campus. And some of that, again, is things like, you know, graduate women in science and our adult learner and veteran services programs that are really designed to try to support students. Um, and again, whether on campus or online, but also a lot of activities, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, sort of tools for you um, that are about making you more successful while you're at the university. Uh, things like the library and the writing center and, um, and uh, you know, all these kind of uh, components of the university who, whose objective is to make you as successful as possible while you're at Colorado State University. In the next slide, um, let's talk a little bit about the way that many of our distance students um, fund their degree programs. I would say about you know, 85 or 90% of our students uh, receive funding from uh, either a, tu a tuition reimbursement program from their employer or from GI Bill or similar military benefits. Um, many, many students also are eligible for federal financial aid, especially, you know, if, if this is something that you haven't considered since you 
graduated with undergrad or something, there are uh, particular programs that are available to graduate students um, and to students who are, uh, you know, obviously independent from family and all these kind of things. So those are an option. Uh, we encourage every student who is interested to apply to this Colorado State University scholarship application. And what this is, is this is a sort of a centralized portal a centralized application that you can put your information into. And what it does is it allows you to apply to a variety of scholarships that are available for students at Colorado State University. And then the last one is, of course, um, we, do have we do have some students who uh, can, can fund their own education and that's again, totally appropriate and normal. Uh, so now, um, last step then is sort of try to invite some Q&A and see whether uh, there, there's any questions that, that we haven't been able to answer or whether you all have any concerns or things we should, we should talk about. Um, you know, again, we've got a good crew of folks to be able to answer any questions that might pop up. So feel free to either put them in the chat or just let me know and I'll certainly call on folks. I'm a professor, right? So I'm used to this. I'm used to silence. Uh, I, I can tough it out. Uh, any, yeah. I mean, I guess uh, you know, any uncertainties or things that that folks want to sort of talk out or. Um... We got we got our first question. Um, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Catherine. Yeah. So this one might this one might work for Ingrid. Um, so how many credits are required, perhaps for both master's programs? Yes, so the both master's programs are a 30 credit degree um, and you can definitely complete it in 30 credits or sometimes, you know, sometimes students take some electives or it goes a little bit over 30 credits, that's okay as well. Thanks, Gary, glad that we at least hit the high spots there, that's good. <laughs> Um, I guess we could we could get some questions started by going over some of the really common ones that we get as a department um, to see if that sparks any interest. Um, so one that I know gets asked of probably Ingrid and Def probably Lauren as well. Um, are you able to transfer any courses into the MS or ME program? Uh, so yes, you can transfer if you have taken kind of individual loose graduate level credits. So something that has not applied toward your undergraduate degree or a different graduate degree. Um, we can accept for master's degrees up to six of those. Um, I would strongly encourage reaching out to me if you have any, any classes you think might be eligible and I can certainly review them um, just to give you an idea of if, if it looks like something that would potentially transfer into the department. Sounds good. And on the same topic of classes, um, um, someone asked, are there any catch up courses um, if you haven't been an undergrad in a while? So specifically high level math courses, things like that. Um, Ingrid, will you go ahead? Yeah. yeah. And then I'll follow up. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So um, we don't have any catch up courses specifically, but CSU um, does offer online versions of many of, of kind of our in the math classes that would be prerequisites for ours, especially like a basic stats and a calc one, um, and even pre-calc if you need to kind of ramp up a bit. Um, so there are options um, available through CSU online to meet those math uh, prerequisites if that's what you're needing. And my, and my only sort of addition to that also is, um, you know, there, there, there's also re-engaging with the university after a couple of years off, there's also sort of, we get, you know, you have to get back into the pattern of being able to do uh, weekly homeworks, or in our program, they're mostly sort of bi-weekly homeworks, right? And uh, working in, in team, having a regular schedule of classes and all that kind of stuff. So there's a little, you know, those can be challenging. Those can be challenging for folks to get back into the swing of doing. 
Um, I'll say in our program, you know, this the, the, the course that I was describing, our SISI 501, is really designed to uh, allow students to sort of have that opportunity to kind of ramp up your, our habits and and um, and processes and and also just you know even just the other aspects of your life to make sure that you can be successful in graduate school. So uh, you know if anything, I sort of say that to reinforce that. I recognize, we recognize, our department recognizes that the challenges that come along with re-engaging with the university after a couple of years. And you will find that our faculty are very understanding of, oh, I've got to fly to Florida and uh, need, you know, need to be there for this design review or all these kind of things like that. Those are very typical, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of constraints that we recognize you all have to operate in in your professional and personal lives and just recognize I've never um, heard any complaints from students that those types of requests are not being um, allowed and and you know accommodated by our faculty so on the topic of courses yet again um, so talking about electives so are there any limitations on the kind of electives that students can choose yeah, so, you know, there are some, but we actually, we try to be very flexible and kind of the point of our degree is for you to be getting a, the skill set that you're looking for. And so um, we have on our website, we have like a, a suggested electives list and it's very long. There are many options. So this can give you an idea of the types of things that we would approve. Um, but even if there's a course that's not on that list, it's just suggested. That's not exhaustive. Um, and so we we're definitely open to considering, you know, okay, if there's a course you want to take, maybe you give us some background. How is this going to help you in your systems engineering career? How is this going to support the classes you're taking in systems engineering? Um, and so we approve a variety of, you know, any type of technical like math, stats, other engineering. Um, like I mentioned, even some business courses. Uh, we have things in like industrial organizational psychology, um, things in like, um, environmental, you know, any any kind of department that touches on things like environmental problems. Um, there's so many options for electives. So definitely you can contact me if you have questions, will this apply? Um, and oftentimes you might have to make a, a small case for it, um, but we are we are definitely open to hearing that. Um, and then yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just can yeah, for I'm some. sure I'm on a delay. I apologize. I was just going to um, reinforce, though, that, um, you, you know, the point is that the student, you know, you have every right, I think, to be able to control um, your education, to be able to achieve what you want to within the broad scopes of systems engineering stuff. So, so as Ingrid described, it's very common that we have students who will go and take courses across the university. And um, the justification that you have to make is, is to within the department very common we have folks who will go and take a suite of courses from computer science or something like that um so it, it's uh there is some flexibility that's designed in there so anyway I, i'll go back on mute you go ahead Kathy. you're totally fine um so when thinking about your first semester what would you recommend in terms of course load yeah i can speak to that perhaps um you know most of our students take uh, SISI 501, and it's really, again, it's designed to be that entry point into our program. And then um, sort of, I think a default recommendation for students in the master's degree would be to take about two courses or, uh, or so in your first semester. And that's a level of activity that I think is, is doable for most students. You know, we sort of talk about that might be um, you know, it, that might be the right level of homework and coordination, all these kind of things like that, that you can actually um, do successfully and ramp up to uh, too much more than two courses a semester starts to become a little bit more demanding. I mean, for some of our students, they have uh, time off of work or the opportunity to engage a little bit deeper. And in those cases, you know, taking two and three courses um, is totally acceptable. But yeah, you might think about like the SISI 501, you might think about SISI uh, 530, uh, you might think about, we have a course that's ENGR 502, that's a project and program management courses. Those are good sort of first um, set of courses that you could get engaged with in the first couple of semesters. And again, start building up your understanding and expertise in systems engineering. 
I will also note um, that it is very common, as we've discussed, kind of getting back into the swing of school. And so some students say, oh gosh, two, two, you know, two semester or two classes in my first semester seems like a lot. And that's okay. You have the freedom to um, you know, just take one if you want to start out with one. And then the next semester, if you're comfortable, you can add some more. Um, so, or if you add two, and then maybe the first couple of weeks, you're looking at the calendars and you're thinking, this is a lot of work, I don't know. Um, we do have a drop deadline kind of early in the semester. Um, so you can just kind of strategize with me about that workload, even, even once the semester starts, just to make sure that it's, it's feeling good for your first semester. The only thing I was going to add was really quick with financial aid, because if students are looking to use aid through the FAFSA, if you're looking to take out loans, then oftentimes you need to be enrolled in at least two classes a semester to maintain that aid. So just be mindful that if you are using FAFSA, um, that you have to be in two classes a semester um, instead of one. So do, do keep that in mind. And um, also, my, my computer, it keeps going in and out, so I don't, I hope you can still hear me, uh, but I will also include a link in the chat for our financial aid guide. So if you're curious about that, um, definitely uh, take a look at that, but I did want to make, make sure that um, that got out there as well. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so thinking about um, balancing work in school. Um, how have past students described their work school balance and then, you know, discussing those challenges with exams or completing assignments on top of also being a full time employee. Yeah, I mean, I can just talk to that. I mean, it's so it's more than work in school. right? It's work and it's school and it's personal life and it's family life and it's, you know, relaxation time and all all these things all have to happen at the same time, too. So, uh, again, just sort of rec recognize. That, that this is an endeavor that you're going to have to um, build time around. Uh, I'll say, you know, many of our students um, do work at, uh, you know, many, many of our students sort of have been able to engineer, and uh, depends on your company or your enterprise, are able to engineer time that they can, like, for example, charge to that makes it so that they can do work on Friday afternoons on the on, on classwork or something like that. So you should certainly engage with your HR department and with your um, you know, supervisors and these kind of things to see whether there's the option to be able to do that, that kind of effort. Um, many, some of our students have the option to do things like you know, sort of the nine nines and take every other Friday off. And that can again, um, earn them a little bit of effort that they can use to, um, to do schoolwork. Uh, you know, again, I, I think that it really, um, you know, it, there's no easy answer here or something. And I, uh, you know, you, we, there's some formulas that we can talk about, about how many credits in classes equate to how much out, time outside or all that kind of, but those are all really just baseline, um, you know, sort of default understanding. Most important is, yeah, for you to think sort of very critically and actively about what you want to do and what is worth your time and what kind of activities you do have the opportunity to engage in. And also, yeah, where you're, where you're willing to make some sacrifice or, or something like that. Um, obviously, you know, not every stage of everybody's career is right for being able to go back to school and that's okay and we understand that. But for some people, um, you know, the, the opportunity is there and uh, the timing is right in career to be able to make a move and do these kind of things. And this can really be a, a, an ingredient going back to master school and systems engineering can be really a nice ingredient of, of career and personal advancement as well. Okay, and on the topic, um... What about some insights on internships and placements? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I'll just describe real quick. I mean, so again, we do, uh, many, many of our students are, um, you know, coming back to university and are employed. Uh, if folks are interested in internships, uh, that is really, you know, we, we have, uh, this is a characteristic of the systems engineering field, 
Um, but uh, there's a very large demand for systems engineers right now. So I think we would have no problem, I mean, pay, uh, placing folks in internships and being able to think about career opportunities afterwards. On our website, you'll find a job board that we sort of, you know, update and it's almost sort of irregularly as emails come into my inbox saying, oh my gosh, I'm desperately needing systems engineers, please help. And they kind of end up there as a place to go. But what you'll find is that, that the demand for systems engineers right now in industry is so high that um, we would have no we'd have no problem connecting folks to um, those kind of uh, activities. The other thing I'll mention is again, it's just back into this uh, the, the context that even online students, especially online students, are also. Colorado State University students. You have full access to the Career Center and the College of Engineering. You have full access to the um, all of the sort of benefits that come along with being a Colorado State University student and, and Career Center and career advancement training and all these kind of things like that is all a part of that. Other, other insights or inputs here or things we should be talking about, do you think? Um, I can ask another question I know Ingrid sometimes gets. Um, and this might be helpful for people who are thinking about MS Plan A. So I know a question that you sometimes get is suggestions or tips on finding an advisor. Yeah, so um, so definitely our our faculty um, page on our website had first of all, I mean, it has all of the the faculty in our department, kind of what their interests are, what types of research they do, current projects, and so that's a great place to start. Um, and then, you know, I, reach out is really the expectation, and our faculty are very interested in talking to prospective students, um, especially if you're looking at doing research specifically. Um, it's, it's, it's great to just start a conversation, discuss kind of what's going on at CSU, what, what problems you're encountering in your industry, brainstorm a little bit. Um, so our faculty are open and very welcoming to, to that sort of request. Um, and in our application instructions um, for the, the master's programs at the very bottom, it actually has some like tips of like, these are the types of, of bits of information you might wanna to send to faculty when you're reaching out to them that can also be um, helpful. Yeah, it's a good point. And I'll just bring up here that, you know, what you're really looking for when you're trying to build up this connection to faculty and trying to find an advisor is you're sort of looking for mutual interest and, and um, those kind of things, right? So it, it's the, the charge here is sort of think hard about what your interests are in systems engineering. What are you, what are you trying to accomplish? What would you, you know, if you, if you were to, to describe problems that are of interest to you or places where you might like to be able to, um, you know, contribute your efforts towards, then bring those to the faculty or look, you know, and look through the, the pages and sort of say, oh, that person is also interested in machine learning activities or is also interested in model-based systems engineering. Okay, well, you know, in that case, it's a really easy email to write. You sort of say like, hey, I read your papers on model-based systems engineering. I'm really excited about the things you're doing. Uh, let me tell you about what I've, what I've learned in, in, in my world. And uh, let's see if we can come up with something or a project or, or a, a topic that might be of mutual interest, right? And so making that kind of an introduction is really um, effective, right? Uh, the, the more, understanding you can bring to that, uh, you know, to that intro into that relationship building, the more effective you're going to be. Well, if uh, if we've exhausted questions and everybody's feeling good, uh, yeah, okay. Well, I'll talk to uh, I'll, I'll, I see J Jonathan's question here. Um, skills that you could be brushing up on and stuff. Um, 
Yeah, I'm trying to th I mean, I'm trying to think about what kind of problems some of our students have as they come in. Um, you know, I mean, I think that there's definitely a role. Uh, I'm thinking about it. there's there's a I mean, most of most of y'all again will maybe come from STEM backgrounds. And what are those skills that kind of wither in industry that we want to be able to refresh before we come back into academia, right? And some of that is probably probably a math refresher. But but I mean, my my recommendation perhaps would be get a book and and get go you know go brush off your old uh, advanced engineering math book or something like that that you did in undergrad and uh, get a refresh on that sort of stuff. You know, systems engineering is a mathematics intensive um, discipline, of course, but also what you have to recognize is that we, all, we, we're, we're, we train you to do those things, right? So if you're going into the class that is the optimization class, then you're going to be trained to, you know, to develop the tools of optimization. It relies on that same background of calculus and these kind of things as, as um, you would have developed in your undergraduate. So it's not like you have to go out and take a brand new class or something like that, but you, you should be able to refer back to those fundamentals and, and feel good about that. Um, I find, again, perhaps a, uh, a baseline and, and probably re-baseline understanding of statistics can be really useful for our students. Many of our, our courses, of course, rely on some of the fundamental concepts of statistics. You know, when we talk about design of experiments and when we talk about uh, human machine interfaces and these kind of things like that. Th those can be key skills that you want to make sure that you're just getting a refresher on. Um, computer programming is also something that for many engineers, you know, if you're working as a as a practicing, I don't know, whatever, mechanical engineer or something like that, sometimes those more fundamental computer programming skills will have um, will have decayed in time. And so, you know, it might be worth your while to just get a refresh on those. We don't have any particular, like the languages that we use will vary from course to course. And so I'm not gonna go out and tell you to go learn C sharp or something like that. Um, instead, get a baseline understanding and make sure you're comfortable in at least, you know, in one language. And then we'll be able to leverage that, whether that's translated into R or translated into um, into MATLAB or whatever is going to be the focus of the course that you're engaged in. Um, you know, those are at least the things that I would think about are places where sometimes students have a little bit of a trip up as they enter the program. I think too, um, maybe uh, a refresher or just some background on reading on academic writing. Um, and so because industrial writing or like writing in the professional realm is certainly different um, from if you're writing papers in your classes and things, we actually have um, a one of our Friday talks with about academic writing. And so we have this on our website if you'd like to look at that over. Um, but in general, just being aware that academic writing is, is probably different than what you've been doing um, and, and knowing kind of what your resources are for refreshing that a little bit might be helpful. Great. Well, I, I feel like we're coming into the end here. So um, maybe what I'll do just to close it out is just say thank you very much, of course, to our audience and to the you know, prospective students out there. Thank you to Lauren and to Ingrid for speaking about our program and, and doing this sort of stuff. And thank you also to Catherine for arranging and putting this all together. Um, yeah, I'm very hopeful again that uh, that we'll be able to attract many of you to our to our program. I'd be delighted to be able to see you in class. Um, you know, from my point of view, uh, this is a really you know a sort of a pretty un unique offering. Um, the, the program that we have at Colorado State University, I think it it really answers an industrial need, and and uh, you know we have a we have a couple things about you know a couple things about it whether it's our, our faculty or the type of culture that we built here, and really this this sort of hybrid orientation that we built up that I think makes this program unique across offerings so, you know nationwide. So we would be delighted to be able to welcome you welcome you to Colorado State University next year. So with that, thanks again for participation and and discussion and input.
and uh, hope you all have a nice evening. Thank you.